Fantastic. Well, yeah, it sounds like we've got plenty to dive into then. Um, so I know so kind of few people are joining now, so we'll we'll sort of loosely friendly um, faces as well. Hi. Get started. Yeah, a few familiar faces, a few new faces as well. Um, so do say hello in the chat and um, let us know what you're kind of interested in getting out of today. Obviously, I'm going to be grilling Ash. He's in the hot seat. Um, and we're going to be talking about communities as a, a general kind of topic for today. But um, if there's anything you want to learn, um, let us know. We're going to take questions, hopefully throughout. Um, so feel free to put those in the chat or there's a Q&A function um, if you want to, to use that as well. But if I don't kind of thread them into the discussion today, um, then uh, definitely um, we'll get to them at the end. Um, so we're going to chat for about, um, yeah, about half an hour, um, maybe a little bit less and leave some, some time for questions as well. Um, if your Zoom is not already kind of like set up in gallery view, you might want to go to the top right hand corner where it says view and put it into gallery so that it's not sort of flicking back between us. Um, it's always really helpful. Um, and I think with that, we are pretty much ready to get started. Um, so just for anyone who is kind of unaware, um, my name's Harry, I'm the founder of um, Unfold. We're an e-commerce specialist web development agency in Bristol. Um, we do kind of two core specialisms. One is UX design, so working out how to make um, websites and uh, e-commerce sites more user-friendly and easier to use um, and ultimately produce outcomes. And then the second thing we do is, is web development. So we work with WordPress, WooCommerce, um, and Laravel to build custom web applications. Doing that across all kinds of sectors from storage to private chefs to gardening, it's, uh, it's a real mix. Um, but the kind of key theme is um, high growth companies, which is um, actually gonna be one of the things that I'm sure um, we're gonna be diving into with um, Ash today. Um, this series of events is called Below the Fold. Um, we're running them uh, every, every month. Um, and uh, the idea is to put someone in the hot seat like Ash um, and grill them on a particular topic. So like I said, today we're gonna to be talking about business communities um, and why they're so valuable um, and how we can hopefully take advantage of them um, as well. So with that, I will... Um, wish a very warm welcome to Ash um, and, and perhaps just ask you to kind of introduce yourself um, and what you do and we'll go from there. Sure. Hey, everyone. Um, thanks for having me, Harry. I appreciate it. And it's so exciting to hear yeah, how far you've come since those humble beginnings that I remember, um, which I guess I'm really lucky to remember lots of people's humble beginnings because of what I do. Um, so for anybody who doesn't know, um, I run a company called Different, which was born out of a company called Yenna. Um, which started as a meetup um, about seven years ago. Uh, fast forward to pre-pandemic and we were running meetups for free across nine countries and 21 cities for about 5,000 people a year, um, just as a safe space to connect. And somewhere along the way, everybody started to ask what they could buy from me and I had nothing to sell to them. So I asked them what they wanted and they all said something different. And that's not the reason for the name of the company, but I might start claiming it is. Um, and uh, um, yeah, they, I tried to answer all the questions and put it in a box, called it membership in a way we went. And it was rubbish at the start, but it's much, much better now. You'd be pleased to hear. Um, and different now basically acts as an alternative to the accelerator experience. So rather than having to apply and probably get rejected the majority of the time or fit a certain sector specificity or stage criteria or age criteria or gender criteria or geographical location or all of these things that come with trying to access programs that act as barriers. Barriers for quality, they say, but I, I argue the fact it's mostly resource limitation that, that defines those barriers. I've tried to create a virtual experience that imitates that kind of vibe and that ecosystem that's accessible simply by subscription. Um, so that's what we do. Um, that's the main thing that I've done for a long while. I'm about to change things up, been working on something quite big. Um, which uh, I'm sure we'll dive into. And yeah, in the meantime, just been doing a little bit of consulting as well with a couple of the members uh, that have come through the community and, and advising them on how to grow better businesses too. So um, jack of all trades, master of some, um, <laughs> definitely not all. And uh, just trying to, yeah, trying to, trying to make it just like all of us on, on the chat, I'm sure. I mean, you're definitely underselling the different community because it's like global almost right like how many meetups and members are you boasting now yeah so there's 
a few hundred members. Um, meetups are right now at zero just because the pandemic stopped them and we could go back to them um, as per the, for those who caught the comment at the start, as per the uh, potential acquisition conversation that came up at the end of last year, I wanted to halt on going back to events because handing over the logistics of currently running events to new owners would have been a nightmare. So I held off on going back anytime soon. But um, as per the new big thing that I'm working on, uh, currently factoring that into going back to events. But events could potentially happen any anytime <laughs> again soon. But yeah, pre-COVID, we were doing 100 a year, um, which was pretty bonkers for, yeah. for a two-person team at the time based in Bristol, running events in countries and cities I've never been to. You know, we've got members in India and Australia and South America. And I've never been to America. I've never been to India. I've never been to Australia. The only two events that I've been to outside of the UK were in Berlin and Hong Kong. Um, which were insane. Um, shout out DIT on funding the Hong Kong trip, but it was um, some of the Hong, Hong Kong trip still cost me loads of money, but um, it's, yeah, it's just kind of surreal really, but you just roll with the punches. People say, Hey, I want this to exist in my city, in my country. And I go, yes. And then work the rest out <laughs> somewhere along the way. Which is, <laughs> well, that sounds like advice. a very kind of startup way to approach things. Um, I guess where I'd like to, to start is, kind of just getting your opinion on why communities are proving to be such kind of valuable assets to businesses um, and, and why they're so important. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, community is not new. Community is everything and it always has been, right? The moment two humans discovered each other at some point and stuck next to each other for an extended length of time, we had our first community essentially. And so, you know, this isn't new. The internet's given birth to the ability for that to happen across multiple locations to people that have never met. And, you know, that probably started to proliferate about 10 years ago with the advent of social media. But now we've got to this point where the fidelity of communities is really high because we now have specific tools that enable community specifically and in good ways, you know, companies have tried to do that for a while, meet up, has classically been one of the, the ways to do that to cross the, the barrier between real life and digital. But still, even though I have to use it, um, hasn't always been the best tool. But now we have community products like Circle and, um, uh, and, and Discord and uh, all these kinds of tools that have taken the things that like Reddit did as a really rough diamond and grew a massive company out of, has honed them and unbundled them into really specific for purpose tools. As a result, it allows companies to much more easily create community as a benefit for what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and so community is really valuable to companies because anytime you have a group of customers that believe the same thing, that act in the same way, that might be based in a specific location or, or affected by the same kind of circumstances, you have a group of people that are pointed in the same direction and therefore could easily be, and in lots of cases now, are a community because they either self-organize using the internet, Facebook groups, et cetera, or if you're a company and you want to take control and ownership over that relationship and that organization, you can put them in a space where they feel welcome and, and looked after too. And that obviously, as I'm sure we'll get into, has untold benefits on your bottom line, both from retention and acquisition um, and innovation. You get to learn from the people that are already buying from you about what they want. Um, and yeah, big thanks to Adam for shouting out about uh, being a member of different. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's, that's, that's my answer on community. Yeah, well, we're, we are also members of different. I can definitely attest to um, the, the value of being a part of a community. Um, it's useful for us as, as a business to be a part of that, but also as a business to like have a community around us as well. Um, and quite interesting, actually, what you were mentioning there around the, the tools, um, because what I was thinking about it, it's like, what does a community actually look like? Is that an email list is it a meetup group and um, I, I guess the tools that you've mentioned there like circle is it circle and memberful um some people might not be familiar with those so what um what does a community look like in this day and age to a business um and why are those tools so so great yeah i mean you know the definition will depend on the person and what they define my definition this is kind of a, a rough definition because it, it can change and it can flex depending on the circumstances. But an email list is an audience, right? Because those people aren't interacting with each other. It's mm -hmm. an audience. You get to advertise to them. You get to talk to them. It's a one-way communication. They might be able to talk back, but then that's just a lot of one-to-one -one conversations. For me, a community is a 
group of people that have the ability to interact with each other and hopefully do so independently of each other, possibly directed where, where business is concerned by certain catalytic moments, events, meetups, podcasts, something, some sort of check-in experience, something or other. But generally for me, a community is a group of people who have the chance and want and independent ability to interact with each other, um, but usually centered around something specific. So, you know, the most macro version of a community might be the population of a country. They might have loads of things that they find completely different about each other, class system, system socioeconomic circumstances, race, religion, background, uh, jobs, careers, interests, hobbies, all of those things will be different, but they're all a member of a country. And so that's one thing that ties them together. And obviously now we find more and more things that tie us together. You might be part of a climbing club. That's a community, a very specific one centered around a specific hobby, but you're also probably gonna be, if you're in a physical climbing club, uh residents of bristol where i am um if you're going to one in bristol therefore you've got two things that tie you together as a community you might be passionate about the city and climbing so yeah it's a group of people that have the ability to, to interact with each other i would say nice and, and in terms of those tools and because um different is run on circle right I'm yep thinking. so what does that like actually facilitate for you in terms of like managing a community yeah, so we used to be on Facebook groups and, you know, there's only so much you can do from a Facebook group point of view that one doesn't compromise people's data concerns, frankly, obviously, as we've seen in the last, in the last few years and probably forever, if we're honest with ourselves. Um, but two, with the customization of the experience. It's only so long I can wait for Mark to wave his magic wand and, and <laughs> say yes to a new feature being developed. And I have no sway in being able to request that and have that happen. Yeah, so big. Who am I to them? And, and you know, even a couple of people who are asking for the same thing still aren't anything to a company that has 2 billion users. Circle came out of kind of nowhere, really. Um, it didn't come out of nowhere. They had past experience, past, um, past success. Um, but at the same time, other platforms were, were, were developing at the same time in similar ways. You know, Mighty Networks is another example of a community platform that is used regularly. And those are two that were in my short list of platforms that we could move to in lieu of Facebook. Um, I'd previously built my own platform using WordPress. I'm like semi handy with things and hack things together. We use BuddyPress on WordPress and, um, and, and ended up building way too much for the members. It was too overwhelming. No one used it and it was too third party and they had no idea how, how to use the complex thing that I built. And so Circle was the perfect balance between something that was hosted and managed for us, had, had really high fidelity and high quality features that allowed me to uh, deliver the experience for our members. And what that does really, frankly, is it allows me to manage them all in one place and manage the content in a really organized structure, flexibly change that content when I need to, manage moderation and administrative pri privileges and uh, run events. And the reason I'm, I'm such a big advocate for the platform that we're using at Circle is um, how quickly and readily uh, available they are to listen to your feedback and then subsequently deliver on their roadmap the things that you've requested. Like I have literally seen things that I've asked for personally alongside maybe two or three other people actually come out of the product where Facebook would obviously never do that. And so, yeah, it's, you know, law of large numbers at some point that will trickle off because they'll get so big and, and it will be a challenge for them to keep up with everybody's individual requests. But because it's still fairly early from a platform point of view, it's been amazing to see that. And, uh, and they're building a platform that I really wanted to exist and, didn't have time to build myself so yeah it's uh i'm happy to pay for it so that's that's interesting so like if we're thinking about either starting a community or managing a community um it there's a choice over like okay we need to pick somewhere for that community to exist whether that's facebook whether that's um circle how successfully did you manage to transfer the community which was kind of i guess you've gone to them in terms of face people are on Facebook, it's easy to kind of interact and then actually take that and move it onto something which is more owned by different. Like, was that a difficult process? What have been the like pros and cons of both of those sides of the coin? Yeah, I mean, we had them managed via membership platform already anyway, at least from a membership subscription platform, which was Memberful, which is now owned by um, Patreon. Um, and like that would that made it easier because we already had the contact details that we needed to be able to tell them hey this is where we live now come and come and join us there and repeatedly tell them that um hopefully convincingly so 
but to change habit is difficult. Facebook is an app that at that point, at least, I know it probably changed since, but it was an app that most people had on their phone already. You want to go to where those people are rather than try and drag them away from those places that are unfamiliar and make them download yet another app on their phone, which I don't really do very readily anymore. We used to do it all the time, but like now it's a real compromise, a real decision as to whether I want to take up another square on that valuable real estate that is my is in my palm. Um, so you know, I, it was, it was, it, it has been tough to make people interact, to go there, but mm -hmm. tougher to make them interact there. That's the hardest part of community is finding the common denominators that people will really enjoy and meeting them in the middle between what do they want? What do they say that they want that they know they want? What do they not say that they want that because they don't know they want it? And what do I want them to have? That's a really annoying, but really interesting Venn diagram. And the best way to describe that is the Henry Ford, you know, Model T Ford, right? The whole quote about if you ask people what they want, they tell you more horses. If I go to our community and ask people what they want, they'll probably tell me similar things. But even if I deliver to spec the stuff that they've asked for, there's no saying that they definitely will use that thing that they've suggested they want. There's a certain level of intuition that comes with any founder building any business that they should move in a certain direction because they've sent certain market changes and certain cycles logical changes in their community or customers you'll maybe add a new language to the development uh, suite that you have as a company at some point in the next coming years and it might be because customers are asking for it or it might be because you've seen certain market signals that say this is happening we need to move into this space ahead of time and that's what i'm doing as a community manager is to figure out what do people need that possibly they don't even know that they need at the moment um and yeah that, that i guess that brings me to like the moral of the story that community isn't always the answer and it can be very difficult, which sounds ironic coming from me, but um, yeah, happy to dive into that. Yeah, so, well, I mean, where, where to go next? Um, I think a lot of people who are gonna be watching this um, are either gonna be thinking about starting or um, growing communities. And I think would really, really value um, kind of your biggest learnings from growing Yenna into different and the success that you've had to date um, and what kind of tactics you used over that period of time to to grow your community yeah and I'm more than happy to tell people this because the annoyance is once you've started it's really really hard to unbundle the, the the bundle that you've put together it's really hard to get out of that rabbit hole when you're so far down it and if I could stop and start again which is part of the plan that's coming up um, there'd be a whole lot of things that I would do differently. So it makes it much easier for people to listen to where I've frankly screwed up or well, not screwed up, but, you know, placed wrong footings and, and gone in wrong directions. The first thing to say is that word of warning, which is that community is not always the answer. Product market fit is a very famous term when it comes to building businesses. It's the moment where people start to effortlessly buy the thing that you're selling because you've found a product that fits the market and people are ready for it and they want it. Fine. That's infamous because it's very hard to find. Community product fit, where you build a community of people and then have to find the thing that they want to buy is infinitely harder. Um, and I've written a blog on that somewhere in Medium. If you Google the right things, you might find it. But like, and that, that sounds really biased, but I've tried to do both in different businesses before. And I can tell you that the latter is harder because if you get a group of people together, and try and ask them what they want, they'll all tell you different things. And, and then it'll take you nigh on five years to get those down to a point where there's actually some value there, which is basically my story. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because so many people are being missold this narrative of build a community first and then build a business on top of it. It sounds weird coming from me as someone who has a community, but I will happily tell people to build a business first and then build a community either alongside it or as a result of it. And so my best piece of advice for building a community isn't to build a community first. It's to go and sell something, sell something, then build something on top. Do what Harry's done here, build a business that has an agency that sells some services that, that does well and grows, then run a really great podcast that brings those people together under the same circumstances about a topic that they really care or from people they want to really hear from. Whereas if you started a podcast about agency stuff and then try to build an agency out of that, Arguably, it might have been harder because you'd have so many opinions from so many people about the services they want to see and the experiences they want to feel and the way they want you to run the business that you would have had so many options that your founder problem then is figuring out which one to go down and wondering how good it would have been if you chose the other one. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, the big overarching story and, and lesson. 
simply put, do do one or two things and do them really, really fucking well, basically. Um, it, if I could, I have over time, and as people will see, if they could map out the journey of different, and they've got like way back machine screenshots of our website, they'll see that over time, we've gone from offering this much stuff, figuratively speaking, to offering this much stuff, figuratively speaking, and getting closer and closer to offering this much stuff, figuratively speaking, because the more, the, the less I offer, the better I can do it. Um, and that's really key. There are some amazing communities out there that do something incredibly, incredibly simple, but because they only do that and they do it incredibly well, it's been very successful. The communities I see not do well, which is where the danger was for Yenna and different at one point and remains always, is that we could do so many things that my ADHD megalomaniac brain wants to do all of them, puts them all in the box and dilutes our offering to loads of people. So, you know, run workshops on a weekly basis for copywriters and charge them money for that. That level of specificity is amazing because you'll get product market fit, community product fit, people buying it and pointed in the same direction. But if you want to build a Facebook group for people that are people, like <laughs> you're not going to get anyone because no one's going to affiliate with it because it's way too diluted and way too, way too loose. Um, so yeah, do something specific and do it really well. Yeah, that's, that's interesting because one of the things that was really on your website, which resonated me with me a lot, was this idea of creating like super fans around your brand. So whatever that brand is, how do we create advocates in the community um, that are really going to power like, I guess, growth in that community as much as anything, but also, you know, produce other advocates of the brand. Um, I think you called them like um, super fans. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's easy to create super, it's not easy to create super fans, it's easy to do, to do it when you know how. Super fans have like a, like a, a solid foundation, and that foundation is that if they all describe what, you're, what you do to other people as the same thing, you're off to a great start. If everybody who knows what you do describes what you do to other people as completely different things, you've got a problem. I had that problem, and I'm over time narrowing that problem down. For you, it might be easier because you're very prescriptive about what you do as an agency. This is what we do. And so every one of your clients will probably describe you as the same thing to other people, which is great because the amount of my uh, word of mouth referral increases and the pre-filtering that happens by the time those other people arrive is already done because they know exactly what you sell. Mm -hmm. Sometimes and historically, that's been difficult for me because, every, because we did so much stuff at one point that so many people described us as totally different things. People would arrive for different reasons. My conversion was pretty high if I got people on the phone because I could actually redirect them. But organic conversion was difficult because people arrived and they were being sold something they didn't know about previously. So good foundation of creating super fans is to have something that's so easy to understand even if it's complex, that it's very easy to describe to other people. Nike is a good example. They do lots of things, right? But they sell athlete, athleisure, or for most people, they sell great trainers. That's it. Like, I'll go for the trainers, and I'll stay for the t-shirt, uh, or, or I'll stay for the, the content and all the other stuff that they do. Red Bull just sell one drink, but they market in so many different ways. I'm sure they probably sell multiple drinks now, but they market in so many different ways, but everybody just knows they're an energy drink company. That's it. And so that creates a great foundation for creating super fans. Then what you need to do as a small business owner, at least in this context, because I presume there's no Red Bull size companies on the chat and, and listening right now, but Never know. Know. who knows? Yeah. If you are, <laughs> then tune in and sponsor the podcast. Cause like, it'd be great. Um, I don't even know if it's sponsorable, but do it. Um, you can, you can, you can basically kind of turn these people into super fans by delivering value. You should be delivering value as a business anyway, but one of the key ways and, 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 hacks i would say it sounds like it sounds so obvious it's not a hack but one of the hacks to creating super fans is to surprise people with value over deliver everybody says under promise over deliver but they never really think about that what, what that really means with their business you someone is paying you money for something specifically but i'm sure we've all had this experience where someone will send us something if they're an indie company specifically and it might have a handwritten note in it or it might be wrapped up in nicer tissue paper than we expected or they might send us a tweet afterwards saying, thanks for being a customer. I know that hotels sometimes do this where they'll ask for special requests and you'll put them in the box, not expecting that they're gonna happen. And you turn up and you've said, hey, I'm a big James Bond fan. And you turn up and they've got a box of popcorn and the whole box set of James Bond films ready to go for you to watch that night if you want to. 
that creates a super fan because I am so much more likely to tell people about it. I'm so much more likely to go back to that hotel and my emotional loyalty to that company has increased tenfold because they did that small but incredible thing for me because they cared about me. Now, you can create scalable versions of that if you're very careful. Um, I know one company that does this. It's semi-scalable. They've been told it's not scalable multiple times, but I think it's I think it's Logo Joy. You can find them on Twitter. They're very active. They send a postcard, a handwritten postcard to every person that becomes a customer. And because the perception is they're a massive company, yet they're getting a handwritten postcard from the founder every single time they sign up, they're telling everybody about it every single time. Now that founder might just spend their, their time writing postcards all day, every day now, but the ROI on sending a postcard because people loved it, uh, because people love it and it turns into more business is really high. Mm-hmm. I remember the one time that we had a membership card. Don't know why we had a membership card, by the way, it never did anything. I had no idea why I created it. I used to send them out with a tiny little bag of Haribo and a handwritten letter saying, thank you. People didn't care about the card, but they love the Haribo and the handwritten letter. And it's just that over delivery. So surprise people with value, get, get a solid foundation so that people can understand what you do and tell people accurately what you do and then surprise them with extra value and the combination of those two things. There are other bits that we can dive into, but those are the two core pieces that I would, I would recommend anybody to think about. Yeah. I think it's, it's those like little moments of joy, isn't it? And just dropping those um, in, in for customers and, and producing I, and that becomes shareable and it becomes part of, yeah creating a community i guess around the brand um i'm conscious of time so i've got one question left but um equally if you know if you want to um grab ash um now is your chance either pop something in the q a or in the chat um and we'll we'll hopefully um have five or ten minutes to just cover off those as well um but yeah just the last question for me really is um kind of what's next for for different for you ash um what big plans have you got um in the works big question potentially big answer mainly because i'm at a point where i'm still trying to practice the pitch on this so uh, uh thanks chris thanks for joining um yeah uh what's next so different's been around for I, I always use too small a number now because it, it times weird and it goes fast. We spent two years in lockdown. So probably about six, seven years now, probably, probably longer. I've learned a lot during that time um, and been lucky enough to help a lot of people. Um, but there's only so many people I can help. There's only so much, there's so much limit to my time. Um, and in the past, I've had to charge accordingly for that and then split myself to the highest bidders. And that's not really what I want to do. Like I'm passionate about democratizing access to the best support in entrepreneurship for anyone anywhere. And I can't do that if it's just me and I'm on limited resource. So over time, I've realized that a lot of the stuff that we do in the community and specifically I do in running the community is actually fairly algorithmic as lots of people will hopefully attest to. I'm bad at lots of things, but I am really good at introductions, introductions to resources, to people, to stuff, to content that people need at any given time. And I just took that for granted for quite a while. I just thought that's what I'm good at and that's fine. But then I realized it's algorithmic. I'm plugging data bits together, right? I've met someone, I've tagged them as in Bristol, building a flower shop, does this, is like this, whatever. And I meet somebody else and I tag them. And then my brain goes, well, of course those two people should meet because certain numbers of their tags line up and then I'll make the introduction. And I'll do that because the social currency that gives me, it's really high. People then value me as a person and I can call that chit in later on whenever I need to, if I, if I need to call a favor in or, or turn it into business. Um, and it's the whole Gary V, you know, jab, 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 right hook, give value, give value, give value. And when you ask, you know, find me there. I'm not a huge fan of Gary V, but that definitely does resonate. Um, and, and so all of that goes to say that I'm building a better way of doing that, basically. Um, if... Uh, th- there's a there's a question for me which is what if i could start different again what if different had the resources of a venture back company what if different was built as a technology company and what if different wanted to help anyone anywhere regardless of how many people that was regardless of the time of day regardless of the size and type of business they were building what could we do and it starts to answer the question, the other questions that, that come to mind when, it thinks, when I think about starting businesses. Running a business is the only job in the world you don't get onboarded to. That's crazy. The failure rate is incredibly high, but we just seem to be okay with that. If the unemployment rate was as high as the failure rate of businesses, there'd be a national inquiry tomorrow, it'd be fixed. But we just seem to be okay with the failure rate of businesses being very high, even though small businesses 
have the biggest impact on the economy. I'm not saying everyone should run a business, but I'm saying the 64% of people that really do want to run a business should have the exposure to the opportunity to start and the right support in building it. Those people shouldn't have to apply for Y Combinator and get rejected because they're not a tech company. They're not in San Francisco. They, they're not right for venture. If you're building a flower shop, you're building a marketing agency, or you're building the next AI to take over the world, you should get the support you need. Um, to, to build that and it shouldn't have a cost associated with it not even 12 pounds a month um it shouldn't have any limits to it and and you know if i can build the solution to that which i'm alluding to now is the next thing that i'm working on basically um then we get to do some really cool things um and you know frankly for me this sounds like massive founder spiel but it's really worrying to me that the next best idea that mankind's waiting for is sat inside the mind of someone who doesn't have exposure to an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I'm lucky enough to have been born close enough to the center of Bristol to get some exposure eventually to entrepreneurship after three years of trying to figure out where the hell I go. If I was born in the Outer Hebrides, I probably would never start because I'd never have any exposure to it. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to do is build something that helps anyone. If you're in Alaska, Nigeria, Fiji, wherever it might be with any idea to start and build the thing you want to see in the world. So, you know, not very prescriptive answer because <laughs> there's no website to send you to yet, but I like to build hype. So that's where we're at and we'll be watch, fundraising soon. Watch this space, watch this space. We've got a few questions. Um, cool. So um, we're going to fly, fly through those. Um, so we'll go to the one that's in the chat first from Adam um, who says, what would you suggest for a software company to do where they wouldn't take a customer address to deliver Haribo because that was a great idea. But yeah, so thinking more software tech based goodies, have you got any um, any tips or suggestions? Yeah, sure. I mean, the first things first, let's keep it really simple. Send them an email and say thanks and make it personal. Like that's the very least you can do. And people will love that, especially if you're the founder. Like if I go and sign up to a software company, that I perceive to be quite large and maybe smaller than I expect, but regardless, and I get an email from the founder that isn't automated that says, Hey, Ash, just checked out what you're doing. It looks really cool. Really glad that you signed up with us and love to be part of your journey. If there's anything that we can ever do, reach out to me. I'll probably forward it to my team, but I just want to know what you're dealing with right now. That already, I'm like, why are that's wholesome? Like, amazing. I would probably screenshot that and probably tweet it. You'd create a super fan out of me straight away and my retention rate would go through the roof i might have been on a three-month lifespan at that point where i'm like nah, i didn't really see any value after three months after that one email automatically it's probably like six months so you've doubled my retention by sending one email that's a great tip the second one though is just i guess more digital stuff what else can you do um and it's about unconditional help this builds personal social currency and company social currency to build super fans rather than just that email if you want to go beyond that what else can you do well, you go and see what they need. How can we help? What can we do? And ideally, you can figure that out before even asking so you can deliver that thing to them and just, you know, make an introduction on Twitter between the founder and somebody else. Try and help them, engage with their content, give them the things that they think they might need. Everyone, if you're a B2B company delivering software, then you've probably got B2B customers, you be business customers. They're looking for more customers. Can you help connect those people together so that they turn into customers? That's one of the great pieces of value that I've been able to provide via different is that our community are all businesses and they often end up working together. And when they do that, they attribute the value they've got of working together with me and different as a company. And they go, well, I paid 12 quid last month for that. But I just got a two grand contract out of it. Therefore, I can be a member for X number of years before it stops being of value. And so it all just adds up there. So send a personal email, it's the least you can do, or a little tweet saying thanks, and then do a little bit more if you can help them. Amazing. Nice. Great answer. Some great tips. Um, cool. I've got a couple in the Q&A as well. Um, do you have any advice for re-engaging a lapsed community? Great question. Yes and no, it's tough. Like, you know, every community manager you'll ask this to will have some answers and and also still be trying to figure out the, the golden nugget answer to this themselves. Um, first and foremost, it's just a, just a, you know, I guess what's, what's the phrase? I say bite the bullet, really. Just, just swallow your pride and get back in there, basically. Just get back in there and start chatting to people. Second thing is kill it, like disarm it with transparency by saying, we've been a bit dead for the last few months. We want to build that back up. A community usually will be, if it's still there, 
will want the community to exist by default. Like we all want it, but someone just needs to moderate it. And we're so glad you're back. Like, let's go, we're ready for this. Um, and then not be disillusioned by the lack of a media response because people get into a habit of not being there. And so doing just one message and going, well, no one responded. So like, it's dead. You need to think far beyond that and go again and again and again and again, and eventually it will pick back up. And it's the same with events. Um, you know, I have, I'm under no illusion that when our first event kicks back off, I know we did one interim in Bristol and it was okay. It wasn't the busiest event we've ever ran. It wasn't super quiet either because people were kind of waiting for events to come back. But I know that if we run an event in a brand new city that's never seen us before and we have an attendance of five people, that's actually a good thing because those five people I can have a really deep conversation with. They'll really enjoy the longevity of the relationship that comes out because it's not just swapping business cards every 30 seconds. It's meaningful connections. And then next time there will be 10 people because they'll have told people about it. And then eventually we end up at 50 people at an event and then it is just swapping business cards because they're trying to chat to everybody and the dynamic changes and their value perception changes. We've got a different problem, but also a different opportunity. So yeah, it's just, as I say, those three things really um, get back in there, do the work and just consistently commit to that, that work and, and don't be disheartened if nothing happens right away. I think that's true of anything in business, isn't it? Just consistency. It, it, nothing happens immediately. You just have to stick with it um, uh, and keep going. Um, I've got one last question for you, um, which says, um, hey, Ash, um, which platform would you recommend for community building if you were just starting out? It depends on the people, depends on the thing that you're talking about. You want to go where they are, right? So if it's a heavily deep internet based subject matter, you're probably looking at your discords, your Twitches and your LinkedIn uh, and, your, and your Reddits, really. Um, and your 4chans, probably, even though supposedly that's pretty toxic as a community. So you want to go where those people are, but you also want to kind of meet them in the middle and bring them to where you are at the same time. So, um, you know, it's got to be the right platform, because if you if you're trying to build a, I don't know, a consumer community around baby products and you try and build that in a LinkedIn group, you can see where that doesn't really marry up. You probably want to build that on Facebook because that's probably where parents are posting pictures of their kids. It's probably where they're airing their grievances about that stuff. You want to do it there. If you want to build a community around VC, then you might want to go and do that on Twitter because every VC is there. They're loud, they're proud, they're bragging about everything. And you want to put that community there because you're going where they are. So it does depend. It depends on what you're trying to build um, and what community you're building. But if you want to know the answer, to that question, then ask the people you're building communities for. Where do you hang out physically and or on the internet? Because it might be a physical community too. And then you take the common denominators of those. They might all play golf and you didn't realize. And so you decide to run that event at the golf club because it's convenient for them. Um, so yeah, just ask them and meet them where they are, ideally. I think that's a, a fantastic answer and, and a great way to... Um end today's session um so ash thank you so so much for for joining us today um loads of insights um i can see lots of people in the chat thanking you as well so Thanks, um yeah really really appreciate it um we'll be sending around an email um shortly with a link to the recording from today if you want to catch back catch up on anything um it will also contain details of our next event we'll be back here um same time next month um, when I'll be talking to Sonia Nissen, um, who, um, I, who's going to be talking all about content marketing. Um, really, really interesting um, space at the moment. Um, and yeah, we're going to be diving into that. So please do join us then. Um, but that's it. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. And thank you again to Ash. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Yeah. Thanks, Harry. Cheers, Ash.